people were posting video, videos online saying like, hey, you know, New York City gave me this hotel. I was able to work. I got some new shoes. I got some new scooters. And that goes viral. And when people saw that, they go like, hey, you know, if there is someone that can give me a helping hand, sure, I'll do it. It makes them sell everything. Uh, and then when they get here, unfortunately, it's a very different story. Hey, this is Epicenter NYC. We connect our communities to news, information, and each other. I'm your host, Curtis Rouser. For migrants arriving in New York City, there's a stark contrast between the anticipated American dream and the reality. This gap is exasperated by misinformation often spread throughout social media. Today, Epicenter's community manager, Daniel LaPlaza, talks with Adriana Proano and Romel Ojeda about the complex reality of migrants arriving in New York City. Adriana, originally from Ecuador, is a community coordinator at Epicenter. She works with our neighbors throughout Queens to connect them to the resources they need. Adriana also played a major role in our award-winning vaccine outreach efforts. Romel, also from Ecuador, is a community correspondent at Document in New York. For years, he's written about issues affecting immigrants across the state and now works closely with thousands of immigrants that turn to Document for news and advice every day. Through the lens of our guests, we'll discuss why it's so important for migrants to get accurate information and the essence of what it really means to be a New Yorker. you mind introducing yourselves? That is your, your name, your title, and the organization that you work for. My name is Adriana Prano. I'm a community coordinator. I work for Epic Center in New York City. I'm originally from Ecuador and I live in Queens, New York. So I am also from Ecuador and I live in Queens. And well, my name is Romel Ojeda and I am the community correspondent for Documented and working with uh, Latino and Spanish-speaking communities in New York. Um, and I'm Daniel Plaza. I'm Epicenter's community manager. So, so migrants began arriving in New York on buses sent from the border well over a year ago now. Can you describe to us what you've seen on the ground since then and what has changed since when it started to now? Yeah, so a lot of the things, you know, that we often heard is that people were being bused. And at the beginning, it was the case. And I think it's still the case. But we have also seen this increase of migration that is, you know, self, self-directed, self I would say, with people, you know, consuming social media, such as TikTok and other Instagram channels that tells them that New York City has, in fact, you know, certain benefits as opposed to other states, primarily in, a, in, the, in the sense that shelters are being provided. So because we have this, you know, migration from Venezuelans from Venezuela, most of them tend not to have families in the States. So for them having a place to sleep, having a place to stay while they get back on their feet, it's super essential. So in the past year, we've sort of seen this increase of migration that was fueled by bosses with a political agenda at first. But now it's just people, you know, deciding to come here because they see that their friends made it here and they were able to get shelter. Um, but at the same time, at the beginning, the Adams administration was very welcoming, right? They were saying like, yeah, we'll take you in, we'll help you out. And throughout the last year, we kind of see this shift in perspective where now after all the resources have been tapped out, after money has been spent, uh, the administration is saying like, hey, you know, we can no longer have you here. And one of the things that have come up recently is this idea of challenging the right to shelter. And that is to say that migrants do not, uh, should not be able to obtain housing under that, that right. Um, so yeah, a lot has changed, but I think one of the biggest one is the attitudes, you know, between the Adams administration, but also the way, you know, people are coming to New York City after hearing, you know, everything that the migrants that made it here first were able to obtain. Do you mind explaining to us what right to shelter means? Yes. And how it's being challenged? Yeah, so in 1981, there was this court case that basically said that New York City had the obligation to give shelter or give you know, accommodations to anyone that was facing housing insecurity, right? And originally, it was implemented to help people, you know, facing housing insecurities, but also people with AIDS in the 80s, which was, you know, one of the biggest crises at that time. It was never really something that, you know, was supposed to be 
as permanent housing. It was temporary housing, right? But after the migrants started arriving, we saw the shelter system, you know, experienced the stress of people just coming in every day, you know, 200 people, 300 people sometimes being bused, but also people arriving, you know, through airports and then made themselves to intake shelters throughout the city. And because it takes a lot of resources, it takes a lot of money, the Adams administration is questioning if New York City has the obligation to also house the migrants that are coming in. So one of the things that has happened is they want to, first of all, implement this new definition of what would be considered a New Yorker. And two, you know, as we have also reporter reported in the past, is that uh, there are respite centers as the options of shelters now. And they tend to be very, very different than the shelters that people, the hotel shelters that people were getting at the beginning of the, of the year, for the spring when people started coming in. I mean, specifically, are we still using hotels as shelters for migrants um, to the same frequency that I, I would see? Like, can, can you also describe how that actually came to be? Yeah. So originally, it was also used, you know, during the pandemic to sort of keep people away from congregate spaces. And when family, when migrant families started coming in, you know, there was a need to house them in, in different spaces as opposed to the SROs, right? Like the single room occupancy rooms. So one of the things that the city began doing is giving out these contracts to hotels saying like, hey, we pay you this amount of money if you can help us. You know. To date, I believe there are like 125, uh, it's probably higher now, but 125 sort of, you know, those kind of uh, facilities. But to your question about the hotels, you know, it had been used in the past for during the pandemic. So it became like a no brainer, I would say for the administration. It's just that it was not anticipated how many people would be coming in, right? Because when they were operating, and this is back in the summer of last year, they estimated that it was 12,000 people that would be coming in. And now we have 125,000 people that came in. So it is, you know, also like a question of real estate. Like There's just not enough real estate for people to be housed in hotels. And the other thing is that it's super expensive because one of the things that the Adams administration has done is they created these contracts that do not require bidding. So the city is paying double the amount of what they would usually pay. Um, Adriana, you live in Jackson Heights, one of the most diverse neighborhoods in New York, right? How has your neighborhood changed in the last few months? Well, you can see a drastic change over the last year. You know, this has been something that has been happening over the years. It just became massive this last year. So uh, I'm pretty sure you guys have seen the pictures of Junction Boulevard, 82nd Street, 90th Street. It's everyone is selling something. And as long as it's considered art or something, I don't think some of them don't even need permits to work in there. So they're selling jewelry, they're selling anything that they can sell to make ends meet. And I know this lady on 82nd Street that she, you know, she was a business owner in Ecuador and she sold everything because she came under the impression that she's going to have a better life and that everything is going to be better over here. And so what she expected to see here versus what she's going through is completely different. And my question was, why, why don't you go back? I mean, you already know because they have been here for over six months and they are still in the hotels, but they, they're at the beginning, as Rommel said, they didn't expect this many people to come. So they were given these hotels for, for longer times. And now they're seeing that, okay, now we have kids and we have other people that we need to provide help to. So they're being asked to go. And so she would cry and say, now we don't know what we're going to do. Because it's my husband and me, and we sold everything we had in Ecuador. So they they went from business owners having what they used to do is they used to uh, bring fruits from different cities to the capital. So they had their trucks. They had a place in one of the markets, which is a distributor in Ecuador, which is called Mayorista, which is where they used to bring the trucks and used to distribute all the fruits. So they sold their trucks. They sold their space of work. And they have kids over there. So there is no such a thing as 
you're going to come to the United States and you're going to be set the next day. You're going to be working and you're going to be making money. And probably they are making more money than the, what they were making over there. But what people don't seem to realize is you make 3000 but you pay two in rent. And then transportation is also very expensive. And then food is very expensive. They only seem to capture the $3,000 that they're going to be getting. Because we're talking about a country where the, the minimal salary a, year, a month is $450, I think. So coming over here, having those expectations, not even in the past, I think, when you plan coming to the United States and doing things the way that we used to do it because we didn't come to the United States before thinking that the government is going to resolve every issue that we have, you know, before if someone was planning to come to the United States, normally they will have a plan. They will go to a friend, they will go to a family, they will stay there for certain months and then they will know that they have to either rent a room and solve their own issues or, or pave their own way to whatever they want to get to. And not come with the expectation that once I get over there, I'm going to get a hotel and I'm going to get food and I'm going to get this. It's not possible. Maybe at the beginning they were trying, but now it's it's extremely hard. And I, from what I understand, they're being asked to leave and then they're giving place to people who have kids and families. And it's just hard. Well, let me ask, let me just jump in for a moment. I've read this before and you're both sharing it now. It's like, Ramel, I know you recently spoke to a group of documented Latino immigrant readers and asking them, among other things, what was something that they would like to have known when they first arrived in the U.S.? One thing you said respondents shared in common was this romanticization of immigration that, quote, overpromised the assistance migrants would and could receive from local municipalities. Can you provide some examples of the types of misinformation that migrants have encountered and how it has affected their perception of the immigration experience in New York City? Yeah, I I think it goes back to what Adriana was saying, you know, that people hear that they can make, you know, $3,000 a month, right? But they don't, they never get this other side, like, hey, like $3,000 a month minus rent is, you know, a thousand now and then minus uh, food, that's already 500. So I feel that online, and this is something that came up from the conversation, is that they are just consuming glimpses of what's actually happening. And 90% of migration, 90% of the struggles, unfortunately, are not being shown. So when we spoke with them, we had a lot of people that said that because of the things that they were seeing online, they felt lied to. When they got here, all of a sudden you had to get a work permit to even start working. And it is, you know, this lack of information that doesn't you know, happen to, you know, arrive to them until after they get here, right? So at the beginning, and this is something that we covered in the past too, is people were posting videos online saying like, hey, you know, New York City gave me this hotel. I was able to work. I got some new shoes. I got some new scooters. And that goes viral. It went viral. You know, we did an analysis and we saw that it was getting, you know, millions of views. And when people saw that, they go like, hey, you know, If there is someone that can give me a helping hand, sure, I'll do it. It makes them sell everything. Uh, And then when they get here, unfortunately, it's a very different story. And that's when we see this this conflict where if they want to stay, they sort of need to find resources, you know, in some other way, which is either by working for other people but barely making, you know, ends meet, right? Do you want to add something, Adriana? Yeah, the word in uh, all the markets. And the reason why I know is because my father works there. It's that once you get to New York, you will get a first class hotel that's going to give you breakfast, lunch and dinner for six months to a year. And I don't know if that was the case at the beginning, but I know it's not the case now, but people, a lot of people are still under the impression. And then when you walk on the streets, you can hear them. Because I'm so close to 69th Street, which is where all the people who have come are standing and waiting for work. And you can see their desperation, right? And when they talk, they're like, so much for the American dream. It sounds like there's an imagined reality of what it's going to be like coming to the States, right? That is exacerbated by misinformation on social media rather than what is 
people being uninformed, right? People understand maybe to a degree is uh, I'm yeah. trying to make sure that I understand this correctly. Yeah. It's a misinformation versus uninformed and that this misinformation um, spreading faster, maybe then people can get the word back or the reality back. And from what I'm hearing too, is, is people come here and, and want to work, want to be New Yorkers, right? Want to stay in the city. So help me understand what the work authorization challenges have been. I understand recently that the Biden administration resignated um, Venezuela for temporary protection status, which will make several of the thousands of migrants currently in the city eligible for work authorization. So if you could first, Romel, explain to us what TPS is. Yeah, so TPS is designated by the Department of Homeland Security and it's processed by USCIS. And it's designated for countries that are facing, you know, extraordinary crisis. Uh, so with, you know, Venezuela, for, for example, they had already designated, you know, TPS back in 2021 uh, for individuals that had been in the country, I believe, on or before March 8, 2021. And with that redesignation, they sort of uh, included more Venezuelans, right, that have been in the States presently. And this would protect them from deportation for 18 months, but also allow them to get a work permit and also a social security number so that they can start building their lives here, right? Uh, in New York City, I believe um, one of the figures being thrown around is that 15,000 Venezuelans would be would benefit from this redesignation. And... Work permits is one of the topics that have often, you know, come up as a solution, right, for this uh, humanitarian crisis. And the reason for it, you know, to expedite these work permits is that with TPS, you don't have to wait 180 days after filing asylum that usually you have to do it with the other form, which is uh, seeking asylum in the United States. Uh, so in that sense, yeah, it, it would help a lot of people start working, making money and you know, wanting to become New Yorkers, right? But the thing is, would that really alleviate the assistance needed from the city? And that is a question, you know, that me and my coworkers also ask ourselves because, again, you know, the rents are just too high. And even for professionals in New York City that have master's degree, even they're barely making, you know, ends meet. So many New Yorkers get updates about migrants from the press and from city officials. Is this information correct? How do you stay informed on what's going on? One of the things that we do is, you know, we do have this WhatsApp channel where I believe 33% of the subscribers, of the 6,000 subscribers, identifies as asylum seekers. So and we as in, as in documented. Yes, in, in documented. Um, so we get a lot of messages from them directly. But, you know, as journalists, we also keep track of everything that the city says and also that other media are publishing, right? Because we try to get like this whole the whole picture as opposed to just one aspect of this. One of the things that I feel could be done better is that the administration, but also like other newsrooms, they tend to just break the story rather than to uh, sort of, you know, keep them updated, right? Uh, and we saw this saw this with the, during the summer when all of a sudden, you know, the school in front of our house, for example, began uh, being used to house, you know, migrants, right? And so, yeah, I think a lot of more work can be done in terms of being in touch with the community just to let them know, like, hey, you know, we're considering using this facility to house migrants. Let us have a town hall. Let, let's talk about it. Because one of the resentments that keep coming up is that they are simply not aware of things until it's already happening. In my case, I guess because I'm on the ground all the time, is mostly people I talk and also the fact that I go back and forth from Ecuador because my family lives there. Let's take it from here. So what happens next, right? You know, what, what should city, state and federal legislators do in response to where we are now? I mean, from the city and the state, we have heard this idea, you know, that there needs to be like more restrictions in the border. But the thing is, you know, even if the borders are closed, people will still keep coming in. You know, it's going to be the new reality, just this, the state, the city, and also, you know, in a federal level needs to be sort of ready and needs to collaborate because right now there's no collaboration, which is one of the issues as well. Right. And two, I think, you know, we're forgetting that migrants do bring a, a good aspect to the economy, right? Why don't we sort of facilitate 
this idea, this way of, you know, sending migrants to places where they can find work and build, you know, a system where you go like, hey, you know, we got 10 migrants that arrived in the Roosevelt Hotel yesterday. They want to do cleanup work. Let's send them there. Or we have, you know, professionals that know how to work on this industry. Let's send them here, right? Because we do have red states and we have blue states that need workers too. Um, so in that sense, you know, if the federal, you know, sort of uh, on a federal level, if we can approach that and say like, okay, let's utilize this for the well-being of the country, then it can work, I feel, because migration is not going to go anywhere. How do um, our neighbors help? How do New Yorkers help? We do what we can. <laughs> we do everything we can. I mean, sometimes I feel that, I don't know, it's just, I've mentioned to you before, I've taken this lady from the train station that was holding a five-year-old with her and was selling candy. And I brought her to my apartment and I gave her all the clothes that I have for my daughter because I knew she was going to need them for the winter. It's kind of sad. It's kind of hard. What can we do to, to apply pressure maybe um, alongside an individual level like you just shared, Adriana, which I think that's very touching. How can we apply pressure to our local legislature, right? You know, how can we advocate for the changes that have to happen on 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 the larger level? Well, I believe they, they're doing a lot. You see that there is churches that are f- providing food to everyone that is working on 69th Street um, work. Like Rommel said, find jobs so that people can go to New Jersey or Boston or Connecticut or you know, different states where they can work. Most people, what they ask for is work because it's the only way that they can actually provide and become independent. As you said, there's also not that many businesses here in Jackson Heights Corona or where they are going to be able to access by the train. So where are they going to get any jobs, right? Transportation is the key in New York, I think. I, one of the reasons why most people are here is because they just jump on the train and go to anywhere that they need to and, and work. What do you think, Ramel? What can uh, New Yorkers do? Definitely, you know, continue uh, helping, you know, through mutual aids. I know a lot of uh, mutual aids have been stepping up. But at the same time, you know, attend uh, town hall meetings um, because that's, you know, where this kind of topics will come up. If there is anything, you know, you can help. You can always donate, but, you know, going back to what I trying to say, like, there's always a limit, right? How much we can help, how much, you know, energy we can put in. I think it has to be like an effort, you know, from the citizens, also from the state, the local municipalities and the federal level. Now, last question, um, kind of circle back to the top when we talked about right to shelter and coming up with a definition of who a New Yorker is almost as a consequence of, of defending right to shelter. Who is a New Yorker? Well, right now it's, you know... <laughs> anyone that lives in New York, right? Because we are a city of immigrants. We're we're the melting pot. But on their their terminology, you know, I assume that it would be based someone that has been here for like six months, as it has been done, you know, with other programs in the past. But then, you know, that's nothing different than what the nation has been doing, sort of, you know, defining what an American is, right? But who is who's a New, New Yorker, Yorker to you? To me, it's just, you know, anyone that likes to contribute to New York City, well, to New York, and that's the, that's the that's the question of the day, you know. <laughs> it's a tough question. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I consider myself a New Yorker, but that's you know, because I was sort of you know made to be a New Yorker, right? <laughs> How about you, Adriana? You know, it's funny that you asked that because as soon as I arrived here, I knew this was my place. Like I fall in love with this city and this country and. I felt a New Yorker, but the government felt differently because I was under the F-1 visa. And this happened when 2011 happened. And the government sent me a letter and said, well, you have not been living in the United States for a year. So you have to pay the out-of-state tuition. And so unless you have a green card or American passport, you are not a resident of the United States or a resident of New York. So I had to wait for the year for them to tell me that I was a a New Yorker. (laughs) But I felt it in my car the first day that I arrived. So I think that if you love the city and you work to be a contributor for the city and you give back whatever the city gives you, then you are a New Yorker. Thanks so much, everyone.
As you just heard, the ability to work will help close the gap between migrants' expectations of life in New York and the reality. To learn more about what needs to happen in order for migrants to be able to effectively join the workforce, click the link in our show notes. And to stay up to date on all news and information related to migrants in New York City, visit epicenter-nyc.com slash category slash immigration and documentedny.com slash category slash immigration. That's all for today. Thanks for listening. And thanks for supporting us as we do our best to support our community. We couldn't do it without you. For more stories like this, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter at epicenter-nyc.com. Our intro music is All the Pretty Horses by Caravica. You can find more of their music on their website linked to in our podcast description.